They're all good Catholics. They like to be at the back of the church. So. <laughs> good evening and welcome to Loyola University, Maryland's fifth annual Grand Seminar Lecture, the signature event of the university's celebration of Science Week. My name is Brian Lenane and I'm a Jesuit priest and the president of Loyola University, Maryland. This weekend has included conversations on professional development and networking for women in engineering, as well as both scientific and philosophical inquiries on the intersections of film, science, and the pursuit of knowledge. We have been looking forward to welcoming you to our campus today for this chance to highlight our natural and applied sciences programs. The Natural and Applied Sciences Grand Seminar was created in order to bring speakers and topical subjects related to the natural sciences to the entire Loyola community for students and faculty from all disciplines to appreciate and enjoy. Each year, the general seminar discusses a topic so broad that not only natural and applied sciences majors, but the greater community can appreciate and understand it. So I've been promised. We'll see. <laughs> Theologian here. <laughs> the Grand Seminar is just one of many programs and initiatives Loyola has launched to affirm and advance our commitment to the role of sciences in our university. There is much to be excited about in the sciences at Loyola today, and I'm delighted that you have so many of you have joined us this evening for our celebration. Tonight, we are very honored to welcome Nobel Laureate Dr. Adam Rees, Professor of Astronomy and Physics at the Johns Hopkins University and a senior member of the science staff of the Space Telescope Institute, which is also, like Johns Hopkins, just down the street from us. To introduce Dr. Rees, I welcome Dr. Bram Rugani, Associate Dean for the Nat Natural and Applied Sciences. Dr. Rugani. Thank you, Father Lene. Uh, Dr. Adam Rees is Professor of Astronomy and Physics at the Johns Hopkins University and a senior member of the science staff at the Space Telescope Science Institute. His research is focused on measuring the cosmological framework with supernovae, which are exploding stars, and Cepheids, which are the pulsating stars. In 1998, Dr. Rees led a study for the high z team, which provided the first direct and published evidence that the expansion of the universe was accelerating and filled with dark energy, a result which, together with supernova cosmology projects result, was called the breakthrough discovery of the year by Science Magazine in 1998. Beginning in 2002, Dr. Rees led the Hubble Higher Z team to find 25 of the most distant supernovae known with the Hubble Space Telescope. Among the results, results Dr. Rees achieved through the, this work, he began characterizing the time-dependent nature of dark energy it has been identified by NASA as the number one achievement of the Hubble Space Telescope to date. Dr. Rees is a member of National Academy of Science. He shared the 2006 Shaw Prize in Astronomy and the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics with Saul Perlmutter and Brian Schmidt for their research that supported the theory that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. More recently, Dr. Rees shared in the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Dr. Rees is a 1992 graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and earned his PhD from Harvard in 1996. We are indeed honored to have Dr. Rees, a winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics and one of the leading astrophysicists in, of our time here to address us tonight. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Rees to Loyola University, Maryland. <clears throat> well, uh, it's a tremendous pleasure and honor to be invited to speak to you. Uh, I really am one of your neighbors. I just live up the street. In fact, so close. Uh, some of the people just uh, next door who walk their dogs around in the neighborhood, I think we're just walking their dogs, and they seem to have wandered in. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Where are the dogs? Anyway, the dogs will lead us back home, I think. Um, anyway, it really is a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, and uh, particularly because I get to tell you this really fun and wonderful story of discovery, how observations of exploding stars called supernovae revealed to us that we live in a universe that is not just expanding, because that is something we knew, but actually accelerating, expanding faster and faster, uh, propelled by a mysterious new component uh, uh, called dark energy, something that goes back to Einstein, and any time you work on something that touches Einstein, it's really cool. Um, so uh, before I tell you about the new work and new understanding of the universe, let me uh, just take you back a little bit before this discovery, some 15 years or so, uh, to show you how we thought of the universe. This is a deep image of the universe. This is actually the deepest image ever taken. Uh, this is taken with the Hubble Space Telescope with, it, with its advanced camera. Uh, and uh, we take a very deep exposure like any photographer does. You keep the shutter open for a very, very long time to collect the light of the faintest things. So we picked uh, a patch on the sky where you didn't see anything really. And we kept the shutter open for a number of weeks over the course of many months. And what slowly happens is the, the image fills up with uh, tens of thousands of galaxies that you see here. Um, some of them are so faint they're a trillion times fainter than anything you could see with your naked eye. And bear in mind, this is just a very tiny patch of the universe. This is a patch so small, if you took a single grain of sand and held it out at arm's length, you would cover a patch just this size. So the universe is obviously enormous, filled with galaxies. Now, when we look at a picture like this, it looks like the universe is static. It doesn't look like anything's changing. The galaxies don't look blurry, even though we kept the shutter open a long time. But that's really a false impression. In reality, the universe uh, is acting like it received a big kick that we call the Big Bang, uh, and now the separation between galaxies is growing. Uh, you could think of this like a giant loaf of raisin bread uh, rising in the oven. Uh, galaxies are like the raisins. We sit on a raisin. We look at all the other raisins around us, and they all appear to be rushing away from us. This would be true wherever you're sitting in the expanding universe. So uh, we see the universe expanding around us today. Um, so you might wonder, uh, how do we know that the universe is expanding? And the answer, of course, is, well, we checked. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk more about how it is that we check, but just to be clear, I I've checked all the results in this talk, so I'm not, I'm not making this up. But, but really, how, how would you infer, how would you measure such a thing about the universe? Well, if you remember that animation that you saw a minute ago, the key is to locate the galaxies, how far away from us they are, and to be able to measure how fast they are moving from us. So I'm going to take you through how it is that we measure these things in the universe. So the first challenge is to figure out how far away things are in the universe. So let me remind you, how do we figure out how far away things are here on Earth? Uh, we have a number of different methods. Uh, one is called parallax. We uh, Surveyors, you will see them out uh, on the road, trying to figure out the distance to some tree without actually going to the tree. Uh, they uh, measure uh, how, how the tree appears relative to something distant, and then they move their equipment and uh, measure the angle through which the tree appears to move. And by knowing the length that they move their equipment, they can do some basic trigonometry and uh, determine the distance to a place they've never been. Uh, now, that's hard in the universe. Another method that we use that is more usable is a method that I call the method of lighthouses. So a ship captain at night 
uh, wants to figure out how far away the rocky shore is. So they look for a lighthouse and they use the knowledge that a lighthouse is very luminous. So if the lighthouse looks very faint, they know they're very far from shore, they're very safe. Um, but of course they could be fooled. It could be a very foggy night, in which case, uh, even though they are uh, very close to the shore, the lighthouse could still look faint, fooling them. But we have other uh, tools. We have things like foghorns, which work by a similar principle. They take uh, what is uh, a, an intrinsically very strong signal, and uh, the fact that it is weak uh, over great distances is how you measure distances uh, in that case. Another method we used are what I call objects of known size. These are things we all recognize around us in the everyday world, except we sometimes see them looking very small, uh, which allows us to determine that they are far away. Uh, you look at this squadron of airplanes and you recognize that these are all the same kind of airplane, it's just these little small ones are much further away. Not like uh, my four-year-old who might think that these are baby airplanes um, <laughs> that belong to them and that they're all together. So, so it takes some recognition of what it is that you're actually looking at in order to be able to measure your distance to it. So we can't really make use of any of these exactly because these are all human-made uh, creations uh, and these do not exist in space. So in space we have to use telescopes and what nature provides. And nature provides us something that's very much like a natural lighthouse. A single star in a galaxy can explode at the end of its life and here is a galaxy with about a hundred billion stars in it and at some point one of those stars can explode. Let me just hit the hit the video here. Okay, there it goes. Um, and uh, when one of these explodes, because we know how luminous these supernovae are, the faintness of the supernova is used to tell how far away it is. We use uh, the inverse square law, which tells us that the brightness uh, declines as one over the distance squared, as the light, uh, the same fixed amount of light has to paint the surface of a larger and larger sphere. So this just means that if a, uh, a supernova is twice as far, it'll be four times as faint. If it's three times as far, it will be nine times as faint. So we look for these exploding stars to tell us how far away their host galaxies are. Now, now, the other aspect that I showed you in that video was that objects were actually moving away from us. How would we verify that? Well, it turns out that uh, all objects in the universe emit light, and uh, they emit light at wavelengths we can determine in the laboratory here on Earth. But as the light propagates from something distant uh, to our telescopes, a funny thing happens to that light. The expansion of space, just hit this here. Um, the expansion of space stretches the wavelengths of light uh, so that by the time the light reaches our telescopes, the light is much redder. It's been what we call red shifted. This is similar to the Doppler effect you might have uh, heard of, except instead of it being the, the uh, emitter that is doing the moving, it's actually space that is doing the expanding. Uh, and in this case, we can measure the amount of the red shift to know how fast that part of space is moving away from us. So we look out in space for these what we call standard candles or in my case, what I study, supernovae, to measure these two aspects, how far away and how fast they're receding from us. Then we can return to that same animation that I showed you before of the expanding universe, except instead of looking at it qualitatively, we could be very quantitative. We can measure the distances and the rates at which objects move away from us. And what you notice here, as shown here in this diagram, is that because the universe is expanding, there's a simple linear relationship between how far away a galaxy is and how fast it appears. Because there's more space in the oh, ra raisin bread uh, loaf analogy, there's more dough between us and the more distant raisins. So when the loaf grows in size, further away things move much faster. Um, so to measure the rate at which the universe expands is to measure the slope of this diagram. If the universe were expanding faster, it would be a steeper slope. If it were expanding more slowly, it would be a shallow slope. If the universe were collapsing, contracting, it would be a negative slope. That is, uh, we wouldn't see red shifts, we would see blue shifts uh, and greater blue shifts for more distant objects. Um, now, this is not just a thought experiment. This is actually something that was first measured uh, about our universe by the American astronomer Edwin Hubble in 1929 using the 100-inch telescope on Mount Wilson. He was able to collect the first useful set of measurements of galaxies around us. And although it looks a little crude, 
This was the discovery, the linear relationship uh, between the distance and the speed at which a galaxy moves from us that showed the universe was expanding. This is such an important uh, diagram, so iconic. Um, I don't have a tattoo, but if I got a tattoo, I would probably get it of this. That's, that's how significant this is. It's just, you know. Uh, and in my own uh, thesis work, I was able to uh, make use of supernova observations to expand on Hubble's work. So this is uh, from my own thesis, the same idea, except here's Hubble's original measurements would just fit in this tiny little red box here you see in the corner. And so we're able to go out much, much further and show indeed the universe just keeps expanding and expanding. Okay, so I've told you the universe is expanding and I've shown you how it is that we measure how fast it's expanding quantitatively. So once we know how to do this, we can start addressing some really interesting questions, questions that uh, have been around for a very long time, like when did this all begin? Um, so uh, because we know how fast the universe is expanding, we can imagine time running forward and everything getting further and further apart. That is indeed what we see. But we can also imagine or use mathematics uh, to uh, inverse the process, to invert time, and say that uh, instead we could imagine, if we ran this movie backwards, that all the galaxies would be approaching each other at this measured rate, the expansion rate of the universe. So we keep running that clock, that mathematical clock backwards until everything is on top of everything else. And that's the moment that we would call the Big Bang. That is what we would uh, call the age of the universe. Um, so it turns out mathematically that the inverse of that uh, expansion rate, which was named after Edwin Hubble to be Hubble's constant, uh, is what tells us how old the universe is. However, it's been very challenging to accurately and precisely measure the rate at which the universe expands. In fact, um, when Hubble first measured uh, well, he didn't call it the Hubble constant uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, he, he just called it K. But um, when he measured this, uh, he got a number that was way too big. So big it implied that the universe was only about 2 billion years old. Now, even in the 1920s, we knew the Earth was older than that, so that didn't seem like the right answer. However, we had to learn a lot about astronomy in order to measure this well. And this was a recent article from the New York Times uh, describing the long uh, quest to measure Hubble's constant from the 1930s to the present day uh, and how the value has dropped appreciably, which means the universe is actually a lot older than Hubble uh, had first measured. Uh, we learned a lot along the way. We learned that there have been multiple generations of stars that have formed and exploded and uh, each generation of star looks somewhat different. Uh, we uh, replace photographic plates with uh, the electronic detectors that are in your smartphones. We launched a telescope into space. We learned to measure distances with supernovae. And in the last decade or so, there's been a great narrowing of the measurements. And uh, if this were a more science-oriented talk, I would talk about a recent measurement that I made of this that's the most precise to date that tells us that the universe is about 13.4 billion years old. Uh, so, okay, so now you know the universe is expanding, you know how we measure it, you know about how old it is, but your question really might be, what happens next? What is the fate of an expanding universe? Uh, this question is very much like the one Newton had in his mind when he imagined the fate of a cannonball launched from a cannon uh, on top of a tall mountain. Uh, you could fire the cannon with greater and greater velocity and it will go further and further. Uh, eventually the Earth starts to curve away, which is to say that you could put this cannonball into orbit around the Earth or with an even greater velocity, you could cause it to leave the gravitational pull of the Earth and go out to uh, infinity and beyond. Um, that velocity that's required is called the escape velocity, and that's what you use for a rocket to launch a rocket. Uh, the escape velocity will be different for different planets uh, that you want to launch off of because it depends what the mass is. It's much easier to launch uh, a rocket off, let's say, the moon, which is lighter than the Earth. So this question about the fate uh, really is a question about how fast 
is something moving uh, and is there enough gravity, is there enough mass to pull something back? And so uh, the way we thought about the universe, we thought, okay, it's expanding uh, and it has mass. And the question is, is the attractive gravity of all the stuff in the universe, is that enough to stop the expansion in the future and cause the expansion to stop and even start contracting, maybe causing the universe to end uh, in the opposite of the Big Bang, uh, something like a big crunch. Um, but Albert Einstein had a very different idea. Albert Einstein was working on his new theory of gravity called general relativity in 1915. And this was about a decade or more before Edwin Hubble had discovered the universe was expanding. And uh, Einstein had been told that the best information of the time was that the universe was static, that it was not expanding, it was not contracting, it was just motionless. And this was a real puzzle to him because he knew that even if the universe was motionless for a moment, the attractive gravity from all the stuff would cause it to start collapsing again. And so what is it that holds back gravity, that, that keeps the universe from collapsing, that keeps it static? And as he contemplated this and studied his theory of gravity, he came up with an amazing idea, an amazing discovery, really. Uh, in Newton's theory of gravity, gravity is only attractive. But in Einstein's theory of gravity, gravity can be attractive or repulsive. And in particular, it's attractive for stuff, like the matter in the universe, but it could be repulsive for space. Uh, that the uh, empty space itself can have a kind of repulsive gravity and could balance the attractive gravity of the stuff. And so this uh, gravity, this repulsive gravity of space, today we would call it dark energy. Uh, Einstein called it the cosmological constant and thought that these were in perfect equilibrium. Um, however, when he learned uh, from Hubble and others that the universe was expanding, he realized that he had the wrong condition, he had the wrong idea, and this was not necessary. He called it the biggest blunder he had ever made, um, and uh, he went off to Mount Wilson to visit Hubble, here's Hubble, here's Einstein, uh, and learn firsthand. In fact, uh, I love this picture. Here is, uh, this must be a, a public relations shot, and the reason, <laughs> the reason I say that is, well, first of all, Einstein was a theorist, so, you know, he would not look through a telescope. Second of all, um, even in those days, the photographic plate had replaced the eyeball uh, because a photographic plate, you can add up light for a long time. An eyeball doesn't do that. The objects they were looking at were so faint, you would not be able to see these with your eye. So Einstein can't see anything. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like a lot of theorists, he might not know that he is supposed to see something and so uh, doesn't want to admit his ignorance. I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, likewise, Hubble probably wouldn't be smoking his pipe at the observatory anyway. But, but it's a nice picture. Okay. So uh, you might wonder then, okay, so how do we actually measure what the cannonball is doing? For our universe, how do we measure uh, if the expansion is slowing down? Uh, and if so, is it slowing down enough to eventually stop the expansion? Assuming that Einstein blundered about the, that other idea, we'll put that to the side. We just want to know how much matter is in the universe, how much gravity that is, and if the, the rate at which the universe is expanding represents enough velocity to be escape velocity, that the universe would expand forever. Well, if the universe were like uh, the economy, we would just wait quarter by quarter and see how it was performing. Um, but things evolve very slowly in the universe, so that method doesn't work. Um, but we can use uh, what I think of as an astronomer's trick uh, to still answer this question, and that is uh, we recognize that the universe does not instant message, okay? That is, the information we get from looking out at the universe is actually delayed information. Uh, it takes light a very long time to reach us from uh, distant objects uh, like a supernova that I might be looking at. So we can use this to our advantage uh, that the past history of the universe is still out there, is still visible to us. And so we can't wait for the future trajectory of the universe, but we can look at the past trajectory, and that's just as powerful. So uh, in other words, when I see uh, a standard candle like this supernova, right, this might be telling us uh, not how fast the universe is expanding today, but how fast it was expanding a billion years ago. Uh, an even more distant one might tell me how fast the universe was expanding two billion years ago, even more three billion years ago. So this is a very powerful way to see if the expansion of the universe is slowing down enough to imply that it's going to stop. Um, and so uh, 
in the mid-1990s, when I began to work on this problem, the expectation was that the universe either represented the model on the left or the model on the right. The model on the left is a very heavyweight universe. It's chock full of matter. Therefore, it is strongly slowing the expansion of the universe. That is, we say it's strongly decelerating. Uh, and uh, eventually the universe will stop expanding and will start contracting and end in a big crunch. Or the universe could have been a very lightweight universe, very little matter in it, very little uh, slowing of the expansion, and we would say the universe had escape velocity from itself because it would just expand forever. So it really became a question of is the mass of the universe very large or is it very small? That will answer the fate of the universe. And we wanted to look at these exploding stars as our ways of measuring how the expansion had been changing over time. Now it turns out not any kind of supernova will do. There's a very special class of exploding stars that the famous Indian astrophysicist Chandrasekhar had first explained in the 1930s how uh, they could explode. Uh, Chandrasekhar recognized that there was a certain critical mass that a star could have, 1.4 times the mass of our sun. We call it the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, at which that star would still be stable, where it would be able to hold itself up against the crushing gravity, uh, trying to squeeze the star. Uh, make that star a little more massive than that, and you get a runaway thermonuclear explosion. It's actually a, a natural uh, a nuclear bomb, if you will, that always occurs for a star at that mass. So what uh, happens with these supernovae is you have a star that's just below that mass, but it lives next to another star. They're binaries. It's a, a, a companion star. And uh, this uh, star uh, may transfer material over to this other star. This star pulls it over, and when it crosses the threshold, it explodes. And so this gives us a very uniform explosion. It's like a, a set of lighthouses out there that are all manufactured the exact same way with the same luminosity. That would be a very handy thing to have, and we have something very much like that. So when one of these explodes, it's as bright as four billion times the sun, and uh, we can see them halfway or two-thirds of the way across the universe. Okay, so um, you might wonder uh, how do we find these supernovae. These are four uh, that I studied in my thesis in 1995, and to find the supernova, you just look uh, for the dot at the end of the arrow in the picture. Um, <laughs> is That's what we usually do. Um, no, we actually add the arrows in Photoshop. You have to, you have to truly find the supernova through some other means. So let me, let me tell you how that is that we find a supernova. Supernovae are very rare. There's one in a galaxy like ours every hundred years. So if you just picked your favorite galaxy and stared at it, you'd be very unlikely to find a supernova. Um, but uh, it's a little bit like playing the lottery. You know, you buy one lottery ticket, you lose. You buy 10 lottery tickets, you lose. The way to win the lottery is to buy all the lottery tickets. <laughs> and uh, that's more or less how we find these supernovae, is we recognize that we need to uh, monitor many galaxies at the same time. If I monitor, monitor 100 galaxies uh, during a year, I'll probably find one supernova. If I monitor 1,000 uh, galaxies, I'll probably find 10 supernovae. And you saw that picture I showed you in the beginning. We can look at tens or hundreds of thousands of galaxies in a single image. And so uh, we can be very sure uh, on any given week that we could find a supernova in an image like that. And then we use computers, which are very powerful at doing image analysis to take uh, a patch of each of the images, one obtained maybe last month and one obtained maybe now, and digitally align them and subtract them, and uh, everything else goes away when you subtract them, but what remains is a single point of light that has appeared between the time the two pictures were taken, a single point that is uh, actually a supernova. So in the mid-1990s, my colleagues and I set out to measure how fast the universe was expanding in the past. That is, we wanted to find the distant supernovae uh, that would tell us how fast the universe was expanding uh, a long time ago, billions of years ago, compare that to how fast the universe was expanding today to see if it was slowing down enough. Um, and in uh, 1997, I was very uh, fortunate uh, to 
uh, get to analyze our team's first data on this. And uh, I had written a, a computer program to tell me, okay, so what's the answer? You know, is the, uh, how much is the universe decelerating and how much mass does that imply the universe had? And I wrote a very simple program. I ignored Einstein's old idea. He thought that was wrong. I'm not, who am I to, to override uh, Einstein? And uh, I got this answer, and here's the key page from my lab notebook, and here's the key spot, actually. The mass of the universe was either going to be a small number or a big number, something either close to uh, like 0.2 or 0.3 or as big as 1 in these funny units we use. And yet what the computer spit back to me was a negative number. Now, that doesn't make any sense. There's no such thing as negative mass. But what I hadn't yet realized was that the universe wasn't decelerating at all. It was actually accelerating. And I had used a very simple relationship that uh, the amount of deceleration tells you the amount of mass. And if the universe is actually accelerating, if this si side is negative, then this side has to be negative in the dumb way the computer uh, was attempting to do this. So computers don't know physics, uh, they just know how to make equations match. What was really going on was I was missing a piece of physics over here. This was Einstein's uh, cosmological constant or you know, his idea that the gravity of empty space could be repulsive. It could do the opposite thing. And so that was the only way to understand how the universe can even accelerate if the matter in the universe can only be positive. It can only cause uh, deceleration. So uh, I looked this over carefully for a number of weeks uh, and finally calculated the likelihood that this was true, that this was really happening, was about 99.7%. And so it was time to talk to my colleagues on my team. I was part of a team of, uh, you saw a picture of them, about uh, 17 astronomers spread all over the world. We had to be able to operate telescopes uh, somewhere where it was always night, uh, which means that we had to be spread in all different time zones and whatnot to monitor these supernova explosion. So I had colleagues in Europe, in Hawaii, in Chile, in Australia, all over the place. And so uh, after working on this a while, I began uh, to talk to them. Actually, the professor I was working with in Berkeley was the first to sort of spill the beans. Um, and so this is kind of fun to look at uh, the emails that we shared at that time. Um, so this was all over the course of one day of sharing this news with the rest of my teammates. Uh, and it's interesting to see how scientists react to new things. They tend to be uh, very conservative, very skeptical, uh, afraid of being wrong. So uh, Alex Filipenko, a uh, very famous professor in Berkeley, California, wrote, uh, Adam showed me fantastic plots before he left for his wedding. Our data imply a non-zero cosmological constant. Who knows? This might be the right answer. Uh, Bruno Leibniz, who was uh, working in Germany at the time, concerning a cosmological constant, I'd like to ask Adam or anybody else in the group if they feel prepared enough to defend the answer. There is no point in writing an article if we are not very sure we are getting the right answer. Uh, Brian Schmidt, my colleague uh, in uh, Australia, uh, I agree our data imply a uh, cosmological constant, but how confident are we in this result? I find it very perplexing. Uh, my thesis advisor, Bob Kirshner uh, from Harvard, was on sabbatical in Santa Barbara, and he wrote, uh, I am worried. <laughs> Uh, in your heart, you know the cosmological constant is wrong, though your head tells you that you don't care and you're just reporting the observations. It would be silly to say we must have a non-zero cosmological constant only to retract it next year. Uh, Mark Phillips from Chile, uh, as serious and responsible scientists, ha, we all know that it is far too early to be reaching firm conclusions about the value of the cosmological constant. Um, John Tonnery, my uh, colleague in Hawaii, who remembers the detection of the magnetic monopole and other gaffes. On the other hand, we should not be shy about getting our results out. Alex Filipenko, again, if we're wrong in the end, then so be it. At least we ran in the race. There was another competing team at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and so there was a, a sense of competition. Um, I got back from my uh, wedding quickly, was packing a bag for my honeymoon, wrote a quick email, response. The results are very surprising, shocking even. I've avoided telling anyone about them because I wanted to do some cross checks. I have, and I wanted to get further into writing the results up. The data require a non-zero cosmological constant. Approach these results not with your heart or head, but with your eyes. We are observers after all. Um, Alejandro Clociati from Chile immediately responded with, uh, if Einstein made a mistake with the cosmological constant, why couldn't we? Uh, which uh, I, I guess I didn't find that very reassuring, but uh, 
Um, and uh, my colleague Nick Sunsef, also in Chile, uh, I really encourage you, Adam, to work your butt off on this. We need to be careful. If you are really sure the cosmological constant is not zero, my God, get it out. I mean this seriously. You probably never will have another scientific result that is more exciting come your way in your lifetime. And of course, Nick was right. So. Um, we uh, reached the conclusion that the uh, universe, the expansion was accelerating, and this implied that the universe was about 70% uh, in the form of dark energy. Uh, another team at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab reached the same conclusion at just about the same time, and so this became the breakthrough discovery for Science Magazine in 1998 that you know Einstein himself, who had first invented this as a theoretical idea, uh, would have been pretty amazed that it actually was something that it appeared uh, was uh, occurring in nature. Um, so let me say more about the phenomenon of dark energy, uh, and I'll say very little because we know very little. Um, so we really don't know, but we have a couple of ideas, uh, really at the idea, at the word level. One of those is that uh, dark energy is really what we would call, what a quantum physicist would call vacuum energy. Uh, there is a certain amount of energy that always exists in space because you can't get rid of it, because uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that uh, you cannot create a vacuum that is completely empty and devoid. That would be perfect certainty about the state of the vacuum. Instead, there are uh, virtual particles that appear and disappear all the time from space, uh, and this represents a certain amount of energy whose gravity would accelerate the universe. As bizarre as this sounds, we see other evidence for this dark energy. Uh, if you've heard of the Higgs particle or the Higgs field, some people have called it the God particle, but that's not a good name for it. Um, the Higgs is a particle or field in empty space. If you create empty space, you create more of it. It is the field uh, or particle that gives rise to mass for other particles. And so this represents some of this dark energy in that you create space and there it is already. Um, and uh, as I said, this is even required in quantum theory, which has been proven so well in so many other realms. However, uh, there's a very uneasy relationship between quantum theory and uh, gravity or general relativity. Um, and so uh, explaining dark energy requires us to actually understand how those work together. Um, it could be that we have a dynamical dark energy. This would be very much like the first choice, except it would be transient. It changes from time to time. These fields come and go. We think that there was one early in the history of the universe called inflation, and this would be another example of this. But you could think of any field uh, like the electric field or the magnetic field that changes. Uh, and the third possibility, of course, is that we don't have the right theory of gravity. That uh, when you don't use the right theory of gravity, you could have uh, all, all kinds of funny uh, artifacts uh, of that. When we don't have the right model of the solar system, we ended up with epicycles. When you, know, when you don't have the right model, you end up with with sort of fictional parts. Um, so that is possible as well, although so far uh, Einstein's theory has looked awfully good. Now, we worried shortly after making this discovery that uh, what if we were just wrong? What if uh, the supernovae were fooling us into thinking they were far away and that the universe was accelerating? Um, it could have been that the distant supernovae we looked at were not dim because they were far, but maybe they were born faint. Or remember that example I gave you of a lighthouse can look uh, further away than it really is when there's fog. Uh, what if there's kind of a fog in the universe, a fog between galaxies, something astronomers call dust or gray dust? Um, and so the idea was we were looking at with our telescopes at distant supernovae and assuming that faint meant far. Um, but it could have been that faint meant something else, dusty or somehow not as far, but we were still losing light because of something else. Or the supernovae back then were born fainter, perhaps. Um, so we uh, thought if we could look back even further, go out even further, we would be able to discriminate between these two possibilities. That um, our understanding of what this would do is that there would always be more and more of it that we would be looking through. and Things would look fainter and fainter. Whereas uh, when the universe was older, uh, sorry, when the universe was younger uh, and more compact, the uh, the attractive gravity from matter would have been stronger and the universe would have been decelerating before it began accelerating. So we thought we could look at, at with a very powerful telescope to look even further back and distinguish between these two possibilities. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of the development of telescopes uh, before I can explain why we need such a powerful one. Um, this is the improvement over the eye since Galileo. 
Okay, it's about 400 years since Galileo. He got a good factor of 100 improvement over the eye. And then we built bigger telescopes over time. We moved them to better locations like mountaintops. Uh, and then we replaced our poor eyes with uh, better detectors, photographic plates and uh, electronic detectors. And then, just in the last couple of decades, we've been able to place uh, telescopes above the atmosphere. Um, why do you want to place a telescope above the atmosphere? Have you ever sat in a pool of water and looked out at somebody, how they look kind of blurry and swimmy? Well, that's what the uh, ocean of air that we call our atmosphere does to distant lights, distant stars, as we sit here. It takes images and it blurs them. Uh, so here is an observation from the ground of a galaxy and a supernova, but they're blurred together. Here's that same uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see how well you could separate the light and uh, measure how bright the supernova is and, and do the kinds of stuff that I talked about. Um, and then sometimes, we're even luckier, the astronauts return to the Hubble Space Telescope and they could put the latest generation uh, of cameras and detectors in there, making the telescope even more powerful than before. So over the last 10 years, uh, I led a team to find some of these very distant supernova explosions. You can see some of them here. Here's before uh, in very distant galaxies. And these ones are then very distant. You can see, again, the arrows that we've added to the pictures. Um, and so this indeed confirmed that neither of the two models that we set out to show were right were right. In fact, the universe looks like it was decelerating only in the beginning when it was much more compact and felt uh, the attractive gravity more strongly, but uh, more recently it's been accelerating uh, and uh, we think that the transition occurred about five billion years ago. Um, let's see, I'm, what I want to say now is we, we spent a number of years, as did the community, testing this result. When I showed you we have different ways of measuring distances. I mentioned um, you know, parallax and lighthouses and foghorns. Uh, in space, uh, we have all these kinds of different techniques, which are like these different methods. And so we have tested uh, this technique of measuring distances with supernovae with many other techniques, and they all came to the same conclusion. I'm going to go by this, part, this slide pretty quick just to point out that uh, it was supernovae, but uh, a second method was used called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. A third method was used, which is to measure the radiation left over from the Big Bang. And then a fourth method uh, of uh, measuring the development of galaxy clusters. And a fifth method of the change in the absolute scale. All of these methods agree to extremely high precision, that the universe is, uh, I said 70% dark energy, uh, 72. 1%, I think, is the current understanding. So we have only improved our precision. So we have a lot of confirmation, but ultimately we know this is true because uh, we were awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, and the, the Swedes never get it wrong. So uh, in, in, in 2011, uh, I went out with all my colleagues to uh, Stockholm, and uh, as well as the colleagues from the other team, and we shared in these great festivities. It was really a lot of fun. Um, but there was a dark side to all this uh, celebration, which uh, became clear in, uh, if you've ever seen this television show uh, called Big Bang Theory, I know it's very popular. Anyway, they had a little segment kind of making fun of us here. Here it is, let's see. It's 2 a.m. What are you doing up? Nobel Prize acceptance ceremony streaming live from Stockholm. Sure. I want to see what all the scientists are wearing this year. Look at these men. They've managed to win the top science prize in the world with no more understanding of the quantum underpinnings of the expansion of the early universe than God gave a goose. <laughs> you should... So I would say we're guilty as charged. We... <laughs> We, we have made this amazing uh, discovery about the universe, but we really don't exactly what he said. Um, <laughs> understand the quantum underpinnings of really the theory of gravity. Um, so if you're an optimist and the glass is half full, you're very impressed uh, because we have finally figured out what the recipe of the universe is. And if you want to make one at home, um, start out with half a percent of stars 
uh, mix in about 0.05%, just a pinch of planets. Um, a little bit of gas, about 4%. Now we're up to less than 5%, and that is all the use we will make of the periodic table of elements, because everything else is much more exotic and not well understood. Uh, about 25% of dark matter and about 70% dark energy. So now if you're a pessimist, you're sort of unimpressed that about 95% of the universe is made out of stuff that we don't understand. We think we understand a little bit more about the dark matter. We think it's a particle, a, an exotic particle that has not yet been discovered in our, um, in our laboratories or our particle accelerators, but we see a lot of evidence for it. And then this dark energy is even more mysterious and will seem to require some deeper understanding of physics to really be able to understand it. Um, but we've been very fortunate. The astronauts returned one last time to Hubble in 2009. Uh, they put uh, new cameras into Hubble that have improved our ability to uh, measure uh, the properties of dark energy. I've been a, a very lucky recipient of that work. And just next month, we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. So you know, it's been just a tremendous workhorse after a, a couple of rocky years just in the very beginning. Um, just to show you why we get so excited when we put a new camera in the Hubble Space Telescope, here's the old near-infrared camera, a camera that observes in near-infrared wavelengths of light. And if you take a deep exposure here, this was for 48 hours, you can see some very faint things far away. But when you use the new camera um, in an exposure that's just 10 hours, you could see even deeper. I'll jump back and forth, but pick out something faint, and you can see how much better you can measure it in the new image and as I said, that's one-fifth the time. Oh, and by the way, the field of view is 100 times bigger in the new camera. So when you're looking for supernovae like I do, you want to look at a lot of galaxies, a lot of real estate and space. You know, this new camera is really fantastic. Um, but we're expecting even better over the next decade. The European Space Agency and NASA have both declared uh, a mission that's largely dedicated to studying dark energy to be their uh, number one priority. And they're in the process of building those missions right now. An interesting development on the NASA side was they were building a smaller telescope, like a 1.5 meter, and then the uh, National Reconnaissance Office. These are the folks in the government who build space telescopes to look down instead of up. Um, and uh, they're pretty secretive about it. But nevertheless, we had heard for years that they had many of these. Well, we had one. Um, and then it turned out they had two extras because uh, they were going on some other technology. Would we like those? Um, and so they donated those to NASA. And one of these may form the basis of this uh, next dark energy telescope. So uh, I'll conclude with just reminding you why I think uh, the study of dark energy is so interesting and so important. First of all, it's most of the universe. So if we don't understand it. It's very hard to say we understand the universe. Uh, it also uh, is intertwined with our understanding of the origin and the ultimate fate of the universe. But I think the real reason we're excited is because we've been stuck in physics for a long time with two powerful theories going back to the 1930s really. Um, quantum theory and general relativity. And these theories don't work together. They're like two sets of rules. One is the rule book for uh, how to do physics for small things, like the atom. And the other is the rule book how to do physics for large things, much, much, much bigger than the atom. But we don't know how these work together. We don't have a unified theory or theory of everything. Um, Dark energy is one of the few phenomena that occur in nature where it makes use of physics on both scales at the same time. And so uh, understanding uh, dark energy really could lead us to this sort of unified understanding of physics. So that's why we're all so excited to see how does nature actually do physics at that interface. Um, so uh, we think following the dark energy is uh, our best uh, route to learning more about fundamental physics. So uh, I will end there and uh, uh, take any questions that you have. I think if you have a question, I think they want you to step to the mic. Sort of lonely, but <laughs> um, hello, my name's Tom Langley. I'm a professor actually of physics at BCCC. Um, the question that I was asking is, and I've been trying to keep up with the literature on this recently, um, 
the accelerating universe is astounding and outside of the paper that was released I think just a few days ago about the potential quantum collapse um, what do we think now about the geometry of overall space time I mean is it open is right. it infinite like what, right. what is the current so view? Uh, right so or what is your view right so a separate question is um, that uh, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, when you have matter and energy, they bend space. And so uh, a related question had been, what is the geometry or the topology of the universe? And uh, it, it, our best estimates now are that it's what we would call flat or Euclidean. That is, that parallel lines won't intersect. Uh, a triangle still has 180 degrees. Um, and uh, this gets at the question of whether the universe is infinite or not. If the universe is flat, then it's infinite. The problem is that uh, if you're off just a tiny little bit in the measurement, it goes one way or the other, right? You, you, it either becomes closed, in which case the universe is finite. You head off in one, like, it's like being on the surface of a balloon. Um, you head off in one direction, you come back to where you started. You draw two parallel lines, and they eventually intersect at the poles. Draw a triangle on the surface of a balloon, it has more than 180 degrees. Mathematics is different in different kinds of spaces. Um, and so it also determines whether our universe is infinite or finite. So those measurements are still proceeding. Hi, um, I'm a first year student at Loyola, obviously, and my question is, you mentioned that the Higgs boson and all, like the Higgs particle all appear when there's a vacuum and a lack of uh, stuff in an area. Is there any um, evidence to suggest that dark energy reacts in the same way, that it just appears when there's nothing there? Yeah, well that really is the question. Is it that kind of a thing? Um, and the thought is, uh, yes, it's probably related to something like that, where um, it's not that you put the Higgs or dark energy into space, it's that if you have space you can't avoid having, that is part of space, that there is no such thing as the, the sort of you know, high school chemistry version of a vacuum where things are empty. Hi Adam, I'm Bobby here, uh, sophomore here at Loyal. Throughout all your work uh, and study in physics and astronomy, can you pinpoint an experience or a key aspect that presented a serious challenge to you? And if so, how did you go about overcoming that? Wow. Are you interviewing me for a... <laughs> I, I didn't, they didn't tell me this was a job interview. Uh, okay, well, uh, geez, I'll have to think hard about that. Um, uh, something that was a serious challenge. Gosh, it, I mean, research feels like uh, a challenge every day. I mean, I make like 10 mistakes every day. Um, the biggest challenge is usually finding them all. Um, but uh, a, a, a particular challenge, um, you know, something that was really challenging was uh, I love working with the Hubble Space Telescope, but it has kind of a funny schedule. It uh, works and then sometimes it stops working and the astronauts have to go up and fix it. And many times we would be, we would find a supernova and send the coordinates to Hubble and uh, we had some bad luck that Hubble failed and the astronauts had to go up and fix it and even though you know this was like the supernova of a lifetime or you know the most distant one we'd ever seen um, the same thing happens on the ground uh, and they're called clouds and uh, you uh, find a great supernova and you're ready to make observations and in comes some terrible storm system and for seven days you're socked out and the supernova has gone so you know the 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 challenge of observing, uh, you know, nature doesn't always make it easy. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, is there a way that you could potentially model the speed or the directions that galaxies and other celestial objects are moving to sort of kind of get an idea of where the center of the universe is? Well, that's the weird thing about an expanding universe is that there is no center. I mean, meaning, uh, it, you know, you're kind of picturing it like, oh, everything's emanating from somewhere. Can't we figure out where that is? But um, as I was saying with the loaf of raisin bread, uh, and let's stay away from the crust, uh, if, if you're sitting on any raisin, everything is radiating out from you. If you, this is an exercise I have my students do in my Astro 101 course is, you know, draw a two-dimensional picture of the universe. That is, take a sheet of paper and draw little cartoon galaxies in different places. Then put it on your Xerox machine and hit expand to 150% or something. Take the new version and you can match up a galaxy on the old one with the new one and wherever you do that matching, all the other galaxies look like they're moving out radially, right? It doesn't matter where you are, everything looks like it's moving away from you, but there is no center. Um, I came across a paper a while ago, maybe like a couple months, um, and it 
kind of address the uh, expanding universe where um, you mentioned that everything, if you rewind time, it comes back down to the singularity that we right. call the Big Bang. Um, it said that using kind of, I guess, different understanding of physics that everything looked like it was traveling in parallel directions. So that would kind of suggest that the universe was and always has been. Um, do you have any sort of view on that? No, I guess there isn't. I guess I didn't see that paper or uh, there isn't enough information there that I know. I mean, you know, we do get to a point before the singularity where you run the movie backwards and we get to a scale of physics that we don't understand. So when we get to the Planck scale, like 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, you know, our knowledge becomes kind of broken because uh, uh, you hit energies uh, and forces that are, are beyond the level at which our physics is valid. Um, we think there's unification of forces that we don't understand. So uh, I've always seen that as kind of a wall of ignorance, the you know, 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. Well, I'm a Loyola graduate not too long ago after the Big Bang, so... Uh... <laughs> you missed the Big Bang? <laughs> Only slightly. Um... But the Big Bang, really, uh, if I understand it correctly, there was no space, no time, and it just in this singularity or whatever the appropriate term is, the universe came into existence. Uh, I don't comprehend that at all. I just wonder what your thoughts and what other theories there are other than the Big Bang theory. What alternatives are there to the Big Bang? Yes. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when the Big Bang was first thought about, uh, and it was actually a, a, a Belgian priest, um, uh, Georges Lemaitre, um, it's kind of interesting, uh, imagined this. This just seemed like the natural consequence of, well, if the universe is expanding, run this movie backwards. Everything began at a place. A uh, very famous astrophysicist uh, in England at the time, Fred Hoyle, um, said something very disparaging about it on a radio show. He said, this Big Bang theory, this can't be right. He, his alternative was a steady state universe where things expand, but new matter is always being created and fills in the blanks like this. Um, there's a little problem with conservation of energy, uh, how exactly you do that. But more importantly, it, there are certain predictions of the Big Bang that are different than the alternatives like the steady state universe. One of those is that there is heat that is left over from the Big Bang. If the universe were always just expanding and filling and expanding and filling, you wouldn't have this heat left over. If the universe were always expanding and filling, expanding and filling, you wouldn't have objects aging. It's like you would always have new young galaxies forming and old ones you know, dissipating. And instead, when we look back in time, everything looks younger. So uh, the universe fits extremely well this story of the Big Bang and any alternatives have been ruled out many, many, many decades ago because they predict things that are opposite to what we see. Uh, hi, my name is Joe, I'm a freshman over at Towson and um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about the Hadron Collider over reopening and this theory of rainbow gravity that the media is kind of like latched onto lately. Right, I'm, I'm excited about the, the, the LHC opening again. There is some expectation that they might be able to uh, discover the dark matter particles in some of the uh, parts that are missing actually when you uh, annihilate things. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm also glad that people no longer seem to worry that it will create a giant black hole when they turn on the LHC. I think, I think the, the way they finally determined that was they flipped the switch real quick and went whew. Um, but uh, anyway, that seems to be fine. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't know about that other theory that I'm less familiar with. So I'm Lashkar Kashif. I work at the LHC. So I'm a high energy physicist. Now, out of the three scenarios uh, of, a, of a dark energy that you showed, an explanation, namely a cosmological constant or, or a new potential field or a GR being wrong, which one is your favorite? Um, you know, I mean, I, I would like to be sort of I think of myself as conservative in this way, um, that we don't necessarily need a revolutionary new theory when, uh, even in Einstein's theory, there is room for something like this. So I tend towards not so much number three. Uh, okay. And then about number one and two, I'm pretty agnostic, to tell okay, you the truth. But number one is very unlikely because of the 120 orders of magnitude. Difference. Yeah, but something has to be right. I mean, something this is, this is be, the yeah. problem. Is uh, uh, So some people, some theorists, you know, really smart theorists, I mean, you know, folks like Stephen Hawking 
will answer this question now by saying, okay, yeah, 120 orders of magnitude off. That sounds pretty bad. But um, uh, inflation and string theory suggests that there is a multiverse, that there are 10 to the 500 different universes, all born with a different combination of parameters. And it's easy to solve a 10 to the 120 coincidence when you roll the die 10 to the 500 times. Mm -hmm. I find that very unsatisfactory. There's no yes, particular prediction. That's, the, that's an anthropic principle. Correct, basically. correct. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so anyway, but in terms of the other two, I mean, there, th somebody has to explain the vacuum energy problem. Before we discovered that the universe was accelerating, that, as you know, that problem still existed. Mm -hmm. um, it was just swept under the rug as, well, it must be zero. Well, it's not, but it's a small number. Um, but then there's precedent for, for option two because of inflation, yeah. as you know. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, both of those are, are seriously in play. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, three more questions. Okay. Hello, Hi. I'm Megan from the physics department here. Um, you were talking about how dark energy and when, like right when the universe began, how there, there's just these, this physics that we, don't, we won't understand with the current the physics that we do know. And one of my favorite quotes that's actually hanging on Dr. Eridos's wall is from Einstein that says, you can't, um, we can't solve the problems that we, wait, I can't remember it now. <laughs> That's okay. We can't solve the problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. So I was wondering, like, when you go about trying to solve, like, work on these problems, if you think about that the tools that we're using currently aren't the right ones and, like, you just need to reinvent everything or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know what you, I mean, I think some of these problems are hard and they merit consideration of new tools. Um, I mean, uh, on the observational side, which is what I work on, we are building new tools. I, I talked about, you know, these new satellites that we're going to launch in the next 10 years. Um, we're about to launch the James Webb Space Telescope in about three years, which is going to be the successor to Hubble, much more powerful. So I know that we will have new tools observationally, um, but I think we need new tools on the theory side as well. And, right. you know, string theory is supposed to be one of the those tools, but, you know, it is, I think, struggled to find application in the, the physics world. Thank you. Sure. I appreciate your talk. Very interesting. I'm Dave Pink from the Computer Science Department. I was destined to be a physics major until my father introduced me to his computer thingies, and I jumped ship. Sorry. So I know just enough physics to be dangerous, or at least confused. Uh, in this case, conservation of energy, expanding universe, can't have empty stuff. Got to be more stuff. Got to be more energy in that stuff. So I'm reading there is more and more and more energy all the time in this expanding space. We have to conserve the energy. You can't produce it from nothing. That's inconsistent in my um, naive understanding of physics. Can right. you help me out? Well, sure. So you remember, though, when, when you took physics, that there was another kind of energy to potential energy. And potential energy is usually defined as negative, right? So if I have an object here and I hold it in my hand, mm -hmm. right, this represents some negative potential energy. Uh, I can uh, get work just by letting go of it. But if I want to raise it even higher, I have to put more work in, okay? So um, we think that the negative potential energy, which is the, uh, the proximity of objects to each other gravitationally, balances any new energy that's created when the universe expands. So uh, we don't believe that the uh, conservation of energy is violated. I think it's also that. important to add that uh, when we talk about the conservation of energy, we always say in a closed system. So what is a closed system for the universe, uh, especially when you have a horizon beyond which you can't have um, exchange of information because distances are too great? So there's a couple of murky concepts, but uh, my theorist friends uh, tell me that they're quite confident that when you balance the potential energy and the, uh, the, po the other positive forms of energy, that the net will be uh, conserved, if not zero. You had me worried. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Victoria. I'm a junior here at Loyola, and I have like two smaller questions for you. First, more physic, um, more on the physics side of things. Um, so, if the universe is now actually like accelerating, how do we know that everything in the universe is accelerating at the same rate, or do we not know that? Like, are two universes just like gonna collide? Is right. that something we have to worry about? 
Right. Um, well, we believe that the universe is what we call homogeneous and isotropic. That means it's the same everywhere and it's the same in all directions. Um, it would be very bizarre if that were not true. There would be the dense place in the universe and the empty place. There would be that direction in the universe and the other direction, um, which would be you know, unique directions. There'd be a north and a south of, of sorts. Um, when the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, everything responds then the same way. Things don't pile up. Um, and when we look at it, the universe indeed it does look homogeneous and isotropic. So you know, the best I can tell you is uh, it, it looks like this is a property of the universe. And then my second question is, wasn't your wife mad that you were checking your email on your wedding day? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah. um, yes, my wife was very mad that I was checking my email. She was rolling her eyes and I was saying, this is a really important email. And she was going, yeah, yeah. And, so, and I'm sure she was thinking at that time, great, this is what marriage is going to be like to you. It's always going to be the important email. Now, I have had the last laugh, as I have many times said, remember that email that I told you was really important? Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Reese for an excellent talk.